So you should have watched the video already where you talked about paired samples and a little bit about the difference between paired and independent samples. Okay, but let's just recap a little bit. So we've talked about doing things with one sample. We want to know what's the mean of this sample. Sometimes you want to compare two samples and really in practice you might want to do this even more than you do things with just one sample. But you want to compare two samples and so this chapter is all about comparing two samples. So again, we watched the video, or you should have watched this video. And so let's skip ahead to page 174, where we're going to talk about independent samples or comparing two means. And so for independent samples, two samples will be independent if there's no relationship between the measurements in one sample and the measurements in the other sample. Or in other words, the two samples don't affect each other. And for this to be true, one person can't be in both samples, etc. They just can't have any way they're affecting each other. So we do have specific notation for two samples. So we're assuming that they're coming from two different populations first with X and Y. And this population would have a mean mu and the other population will also have a mean mu. And they'd have their standard deviations. But we don't actually know the population means and standard deviations usually. Usually we take a sample. So we have our sample size. We'll call them N and M. Our sample mean will be X bar and Y bar and standard deviations will be S with a little x and S with a little y, just so we can tell it apart between the two populations. So for example, let's say we have a bank manager that has a new system to reduce the time customers spend waiting. We could think of population one as the waiting times on the current system. Let's say the first day the bank uses the current system and the manager randomly selects 100 customers and finds that the sample mean waiting time is 8.79 minutes. Then population two, we could use that as the waiting times of the new system. So the second day, the bank uses the new system, and the manager randomly selects 80 customers and found a sample mean waiting time of 5.14. So notice here, for our first population, we set a sample size as n, and then we switch to an m just to distinguish between the two. And the means are x bar and, again, y bar. Now our ultimate goal would not be to look at the sample means, but to compare the population means. So we want to compare the population means of mu x and mu y. And to do this, we'd look at the difference, mu x minus mu y. So first, what would be a good point estimate okay, of the difference in our population means? If you want to compare the difference in the population means, you probably go through and look at the difference in the sample means. So if you want to compare the difference in population means, look at difference in the sample means. So in our case, it would be x bar minus y bar. That would be our best estimate for the difference in the population means. So we'll talk about a little bit of theory. So first of all, I'm just saying we have two populations. We have our means, mu x, variance, x bar is our sample mean. Same thing for our second population. So let's consider we have one population, and if we were to take a sample and look at the mean, based on one sample, I would get a specific mean. If I took a different sample, would I get the exact same mean? No, I would expect to get a different mean. And for every different sample I take, I would get a different sample mean, right? And so different samples from our first population would give us different values of x bar. And then for my second population, based on which sample I get, I'll get different values for my sample mean. So based on which samples you pick, you'll get different values of this x bar minus y bar. So because you can get different values of it, it's considered a random variable and it has its own sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution for your difference in your sample means here is if your two samples are independent, then the population of all the possible values for the difference in your sample means would now this is the most important part you have to remember from this page. It's going to have a normal distribution, which means you can go ahead and do everything here. If <coughs> either both the populations are normally distributed or both sample sizes are at least 30. So you do have to check both. Okay. Or there's another one. Or if one is normal and the other has a sample size of at least 30. So they don't have to be the same, but each one has to either be normal or have a large sample size. 
the expected value or the mean would just be equal to the difference in the two means and the standard deviation would be equal to the square root of you take each variance divided by its sample size and add them together. With that, let's, so again we're just kind of building the theory here. We said that our test statistic, before I told you a test statistic, usually follows the form of the estimate minus the hypothesized value over standard deviation of the estimate. So let's say we want to know if the difference in the unknown population means is equal to some specific value. So we think the mean of x minus the mean of y might be equal to say 3. We put a 3 there. Or maybe we think it's equal to 5. It's just whatever you think the difference in the population means might be equal to. So what would our appropriate test statistic be then? So looking at this form, we first look at our estimate. Our estimate is the difference in the sample means minus the hypothesized value. So that would be what's right here. This, we're saying this is what we think the difference in the means is. So minus delta, that's called delta, over the square root because it's standard deviation of the estimate, which we have up here square root of we take the first variance for x divided by its sample size plus the second variance for y divided by its sample size. So this is going to be our theoretical test statistic. Now, in practice, this delta, the difference in your population means, or what you think the difference in the population means is, is usually zero. Okay, not always. There, if when you go home this week, there's one video to watch for you to watch where I have something that's not a zero there. But most of your problems, it'll just be a zero. Now, what's nice about that? If delta is zero, then what happens to this formula up here? If delta is going to be zero, do I need to worry about minusing delta? Okay, no. So we usually just drop that. So we had our null hypothesis would be that the mean of x minus the mean of y equals delta. But instead of a delta, we said we're usually going to do a zero. Now since then mu of x minus mu of y equals zero, that just seems so complicated or unnecessarily complicated usually. So what we can do is we can change this to the null hypothesis would be that the mean of x equals the mean of y. That's the same thing. We haven't changed anything algebraically. And that just seems so much friendlier to us. Okay. So what this is saying is the null hypothesis is that our two population means are equal. That makes sense for a good status quo. Then as far as the alternatives, instead of saying like the mean of x minus the mean of y is less than zero, this is that the mean of x is less than the mean of y. The next would be the mean of x is greater than the mean of y. And the mean of x is not equal to the mean of y. We like these ways to write it a lot better. But if you ever wanted to actually have some delta that wasn't a zero, then you can kind of come back to this mu of x minus mu of y equals zero format instead. So that was in theory. Here's what you need to know what you'll actually do. These are two sample tests for the mean of x and mean of y. So we use this when we want to compare two population means. So we had a different test for one population mean. Now we have a test for two population means. And the next thing we'll learn in the next chapter is if you want to have more than two. And we use these tests if we have independent samples. So on here, our assumptions are that the populations are normally distributed or both sample sizes are at least 30. The null hypothesis will be that the two means are equal. Then for your test statistic, this is where it gets a little complicated. You'll notice that I have three different things here. Two sample Z test, two sample T test, and two sample T test, another version. So there's three different tests here. 
It turns out that you do everything else exactly the same except for your test statistics, so I just kind of have it all lumped in together in this one spot. So if you have a two-sample z-test, how do you tell the difference between a z-test and a t-test? Do you remember? Okay. Yeah, so Justin here is saying you know the difference based on whether or not the population standard deviation is known or unknown. So if you know the population standard deviation, use Z. If you know sample SD, we use a T test. And this is the same for the entire semester. So if we have two samples and we know the population standard deviations, we'll use a z-test. <coughs> now the z-test says if you know the population variances. Now whether you know standard deviation or variance, that doesn't matter because you just square one to get the other. We're going to use this test statistic. So z is going to be equal to, we'll do x bar minus y bar over square root of each variance over its sample size. So that's what we basically already looked at in the last page. And we'll use the standard normal distribution or meaning we'll use the z-table to look up our probabilities. And that one's pretty simple. Now for the t-test though, so if we don't know our population variances, instead if you just know your sample variances or standard deviations, we have to use a t-test, but there's two kinds of t-tests. So the first one is if you think that you have equal variances, that's why we say here equal variances. We'll use this test statistic. So what you do is x bar minus y bar over the square root, and you have this sp thing. This is called, the sp is called your pooled variance. What it is is it's kind of a weighted variance because you think they're kind of about the same, you kind of weight it and it's kind of like a average of your variances maybe. And then you times that by 1 over n plus 1 over m. So it's very similar to what we have up here on z, but instead of having different variances, you kind of have this weighted common pooled variance. And your pooled variance, which you have to calculate separately, you do n minus 1 times the first variance plus the second sample size minus 1 times its variance over, you add the two sample sizes and minus 2. So it looks very long and complicated, and it does take a long time to calculate. And we'll use the t distribution with, and then you have to have degrees of freedom. You do n plus m minus 2. This is why we really like computers instead of doing it by hand. Now, if you want a two-sample t test with unequal variances, so we don't know what the variances are, but we think that they're probably not the same, or if we don't know for sure, then we use this test statistic. So it's x bar minus y bar, square root, do each sample variance over a sample size. So that's a very easy test statistic, but look at the degrees of freedom. So you have to use a t-distribution with what's called the Satterthwaite approximation of degrees of freedom. And so your degrees of freedom is a super long, complicated looking formula involving your variances, sample variances, and your sample sizes. Lots of times, I'll probably make you do it once or twice, but then after that, on the test or something, I'd say, here's what your degrees of freedom are to save time, and quite a few times on the homework. Okay, If you don't know what to use, this two-sample t-test is kind of the safer choice. It's if you weren't sure if your variances were the same or not, you'll get more accurate results if you choose the unequal variances and were wrong than if you choose equal variances and was wrong on that. But the two sample t test with equal variances is more powerful. So if you do have equal variances, it's better to use this because it's more powerful. Powerful meaning you're more likely to reject your null when you should. So it's more powerful, which is good, but that only helps if you actually have equal variances. If you're not sure, you'd go with your safer choice of the unequal variances. And then p-values, this part shouldn't be too surprising because it's going to be exactly like what we've been doing, so you don't have to learn anything new. 
the p-value again is always the area in the tail or tails. So if you have a greater than, you shade to the right, less than, shade to the left, and a not equal to, you'll have both tails just like every problem we've done so far. So now that we've talked about all that, let's try an example. So suppose a random sample of 100 waiting times is observed under the current system. I think we're talking about the waiting times at the bank again. Gives a sample mean of 8.79 and a random sample of 80 waiting times gives a sample mean of 5.14 on the new system. Now as I'm doing these, it's very important you kind of come through and write down your information. So for our current system, our old system, we had a sample size of 100, <coughs> our sample mean of 8.79, and let's see, they haven't told me the standard deviation yet, so let's keep going. For my new system, we have a sample size of 80, and a sample mean of 5.14. And if you write it all out like this, it's going to be a lot easier to plug everything in. Let's assume that somehow, now I have somehow emphasized here, because it's saying somehow we know the population variance. Now usually, do you know the population variance if you don't know the population mean? No, but there's a few instances where this might kind of be appropriate. So let's assume that somehow we know or think we know what the population variances are. So we think that for the old system, our x is 4.7, and for the new system, our y, it's 1.9. Let's conduct a hypothesis test to see if the new system reduces the waiting times. So we want to know is, okay. now here's the thing, I'm, I wrote old here first. I didn't have to write old first, but I did. Because I wrote old first here, for the entire rest of the problem, I will write old first. Okay. So we want to know is the mean for old, we want to compare that for the mean for new. Which direction should this sign go? They want to see if the new system reduces the waiting time. So new should be smaller, so old should be greater, right? So get your hypothesis set up like this. Once you know what sign it goes, or which way your sign is going, then that kind of tells you what to do for the rest of the problem. Again, the most important thing is once you write down old first here, everything else for the rest of the problem, you will always do old first. So we know that. We know we want to use alpha equals 0.05. And which of those three tests are we going to use? We know here my population variance, so we have to use a Z test. So these are two sample Z tests. First step is usually pick alpha, but they told me to use 0.05. Then we also want to check our assumptions. And so remember, it's either both have large sample sizes or both are normally distributed. So our sample sizes are 80 and 100. Those are both big. So we both have large sample sizes. So we'll check that off. For our hypotheses, the alternative hypothesis, what we're kind of hoping to show is we're hoping to show that the old one is greater than the new one. So the mean for the old is greater than mean for the new. Now you can write these with x's and y's, but then I forget which one's which, so I like to use descriptive words. And if the alternative is a greater than, what do you think the null will be? Everything we've done so far has had an equals in the null, right? So the mean for the old equals the mean for the new. So status quo would be that the new system doesn't really change anything. It's not worth changing what system we use. The alternative, though, is that the old one was greater than the new one, or in other words, the new one would be faster, which would be good. Next step is our test statistic, which is z equals. Well, find the difference in the sample means. 
divide by the square root of, we'll do each variance over its sample size. Now this is where it's really important that I wrote everything down up above. So when it says x, you might be wondering like, okay, well which one was x or which one do I do first? Just remember up here, we said we're going to do old first, so make sure you do old first down here. So x bar, or the sample mean for my old, is 8.79, then minus your new one for 5.14. Okay, the old variance is 4.7 divided by its sample size of 100. So make sure you match up the correct variance and the correct sample size. And the new variance is 1.9 and its sample size is 80. So I got 13.72. For your p-value, we have our 13.72. Now look at your alternative. This is a greater than. So for a greater than, we have to shade to the right. Now this is a Z test, so we'll use the Z table. I'm going to go try and find the area to the right of 13.72, which is going to be very, very small, right? Because my chart only goes up to 3.49 and the area to the left is already almost zero, or almost one, so the area to the right is almost zero. So by the time I get to 13, it's going to be even smaller. So it's basically zero. So that would certainly be a small p-value, which means we'll reject our null. Now you guys might have noticed on the exam that I had a multiple choice that might have seemed like it was saying the same thing. But when we reject or fail to reject, we're always rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis, not the alternative. So we reject the null, and then that gives us evidence for the alternative. So evidence that looking up above, my alternative is that the mean for the old is greater than mean for the new. write something like we have extremely strong evidence that the average time on the old system for all the customers, you always have to kind of add in that word all or population, so means for everyone and not just my sample. So the average time on the old system for all the customers is greater, so mean for old is greater, than the average waiting time for all customers on the new system. So we have evidence that it's quite a bit, or we have a lot of evidence that is sh smaller and we probably want to switch to the new system. Uh, the one thing with hypothesis test, remember, is it just says how sure we are. It doesn't actually really tell you how big the difference is. In our next example, we have a production supervisor needs to determine which talus X, A, or Z, B will maximize the hourly yield. He takes a sample of five hours for each process and finds that catalyst X, A, the sample mean is 811, variance is 386. For catalyst Z, B, sample mean is 750, variance is 44. Notice on this one, I didn't even tell you, like, use the symbols X bar or Y bar. So let's go through and write down what they're telling me as they do it. So for XA, they had a sample mean, oh, let's see, a sample of five hours. So my sample size is five. My sample mean is 811, so we'll call that X bar. And the variance is 386. So variance means that we'll do a sigma squared or an S squared. Now, does this sound like a sample variance or a population variance? I think this one would be a sample variance because it's saying he took a sample, here's the sample mean, here's the variance, so I think it's a sample variance. So we'll call it an S squared equals 386. For ZB, the sample mean is 750. 
So y bar equals 750. The variance is 484. What about my sample size? Notice he took a sample of five hours for each process, so this sample size is also five. Now notice these are my variances, right? What if I'd wanted to know the standard deviations instead? Just as kind of a review. How do we go from the variance to the standard deviation? Just take the square root, right? So square root of 386 means that my standard deviation would be 19.6. And square root of 484 means my standard deviation is 22. So when I look at these things, oh, let's see, let's continue, finish reading it. Assume the populations are normally distributed. So both of them are normal, which means I can use any of those three tests. Let's conduct a hypothesis test to see if the cat two catalysts have different population mean hourly yields. So I just said, are they different? They didn't say which one is bigger or smaller. And let's use alpha equals 0.01. So first of all, when I look at this, it seems like I have my sample variance or sample standard deviation, so I know I have to use a t-test. So this is the two-sample t-test. But we do have two different t-tests, so which one are we going to use here? Now you might first look at the variance and say 386 and 484, those sound like different numbers. But what if you look at the standard deviations? Do the standard deviations seem very different? The standard deviations aren't that different, especially if you consider how big like the means are. One of the things I prefer to do is instead of just looking at the numbers, I would look at actual box plots or histograms for them. Because if you look at these two box plots, do the two box plots seem very different? And specifically, if you're considering standard deviation or variance, how different is the spread? Do they seem like they're spread about the same? Or like if you were just to look at this, would you have told me that the standard deviation was about the same? So when I look at these, these seem fairly similar. So looking at the actual graph, those, the spreads seem about the same. So I know when you first look at the variance, it seems like they're different, but if you look at the standard deviations, 19.6 and 22, that's actually really close. And if you look at the actual picture, the spread seems to be very similar. So sometimes it's kind of a matter of almost proportion, uh, which you see by looking at the actual graphs. So here, I think the spread's about the same, and I'm actually going to use equal variances. So going through my steps, they said use alpha equals 0.01. We also need to check our assumptions. We did say both populations were normal. So we're good, we can use this test. We need to know our hypotheses. Null and alternative. So let's see, on the alternative they said, see if the two catalysts have different population means. Now I wrote XA first, so I'm gonna keep writing XA first. So the mean for XA is not equal to the mean for ZB. So they didn't say which one they think is better, or higher or lower, they just said are they different. The null then, status quo, would be that they are the same. So the mean for XA equals the mean for ZB. Normally our next step would be to look at the test statistic, but as part of our test statistic, for equal variances you have to do the pooled variance. This isn't a formula I expect you to memorize. In fact, I don't even have it memorized unless I've worked quite a few problems in a row. But it goes like this, you take the first sample size minus one times the first variance, plus the second sample size minus one times its variance. 
over the first sample size plus the second sample size minus 2. So let's plug all this in. So n minus 1, my first sample size is 5. So 5 minus 1 times my first variance of 386. Plus my next sample size, which is also 5 minus 1, times its variance, so my second variance is 750. No, nope, that's the wrong number. My variance is 484. Over first sample size, plus second sample size, minus 2. When I put this in my calculator, I get 435. Now notice up here my variances are 386 and 484, and what's this pooled variance? 435 is kind of in the middle. It's kind of like an average. It's just a specially weighted average, basically. And so your pooled variance will always kind of be somewhere in the middle, kind of taking the average of your two variances. Now that we've done all that, we can actually find t. So t is equal to you take each sample mean, subtract them, divide by the square root, and you'll do that pooled variance you just calculated. It's kind of the average, weighted average of your two variances. And one over your first sample size plus one over your second sample size. So let's plug everything in. Again, the most important thing is I wrote xa first here. Well, at the very top, so I keep writing xa first every time. So when I do subtract my sample means, subtract the sample mean for xa first. So 811 minus your second sample mean of 750 over the square root of that pooled variance we found of 435. And we'll do one over each sample size, although they were both five. So I get 4.624. So that's our test statistic. Now, anytime we've ever worked with the t-distribution, remember you also need degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is going to be a first sample size plus second sample size minus two. My sample sizes are both 5. So 5 plus 5 minus 2 equals 8. Now one of the things that you'll find as we do each new test is you have new formulas. And yes, these formulas are a pain in the butt. You have to go through very carefully and plug everything in. But the main ideas don't change. Okay? How you find your null and alternative hypotheses don't change. Assumptions really aren't changing that much. It's you follow the exact same process on every single hypothesis test, no matter what we're doing. And so the big ideas, hopefully, don't feel new. It's just some new formulas. For our p-value, here's my 4.624. Which direction do I need to shade? For this, you always look at your alternative hypothesis which is a not equals to. Not equals to means we don't know which direction we're interested in, so what do we do there? When it's a different to or different from, we look at both sides. So here's my 4.64, here's my negative 4.624, and I want to shade in both tails. We're going to go to the T table. We have 8 degrees of freedom. We're looking for 4.624. So 8 degrees of freedom. We want 4.624. Looks like we're about here. So my P value area to the right is between 0 0.001 and 0 0.0005. So this is between 0 0.0005 to 0 0.001. So each side is that big. So what happens if we add them together? My p-value is going to be between, so we add 0 0.005 and 0 0.0005, we get 0 0.001. And if we do 0 0.01 plus 0 0.001, we get 0 0.002. Now the exact from the calculator is 0 0.0017. So somewhere between those two numbers, you know that, correct? Now looking at this p-value, this is smaller than our alpha of 0 0.01. So this is a small p-value, which means we'll reject our null. 
and then we have evidence that the mean for XA is not equal to the mean for ZB. And so we'd come in and write something like, we found very strong evidence that the population means, or population mean yields, are different. Notice again on our actual hypothesis test, it doesn't tell us which one is higher or lower. You have to go through and use a little bit of human intuition or human logic to figure that out. So let's try our next example. I want to know if a new billing system will save time. When I take a random sample of 45 billing times from the old system, I get a sample mean of 4 days and a sample variance of 16. So let's write everything down here. For my old system, n equals 45. The sample mean is 4. And the sample variance is 16. When I take a random sample of 60 billing times for the new system, I get a sample mean of 2 and the sample variance of 5. So for my new, n equals 60, my sample mean is 2, my variance is 5. And we want to know, has the new billing system reduced the billing time? So we want to know, so if we're comparing it, we wrote down old first, so let's keep it in the same order. If the new billing system reduced time, then the new one should be smaller, which means that the old one should be bigger. Now, I do know my sample variance is here, which means I have to do a t-test. But the question is, should I use equal or unequal variances? Now, when I look at the 16 and 5, okay, you might think, okay, well, that's closer than our previous one of 386 and 484. But there's no graph here. And without the graph, I don't know if I really feel like those are the same or not. Plus, my numbers, my overall numbers of like 4 and 2 for my sample means tells me I'm dealing, working with a much smaller scale overall. And so I'm not really sure if those should be equal or not. And really in practice, you should probably always be looking at a graph to know because that's a much easier way to know than just looking at your two numbers. So I'm not really sure which one to do here, so I'm going to do unequal variances. Because if you're never if you're ever unsure, you always do unequal variances. That's kind of the safer choice. So, if you aren't sure, use unequal variances. Now, later this week, you'll watch another video where I do one problem and we do both methods and compare the results and the results end up being very similar. And that's often the case, that they're fairly similar. So let's look here. Let's check. We need an alpha. I'm just going to say 0.05. We need to check our assumptions. We need big sample sizes or normal distributions. It looks here that both my sample sizes of 45 and 60 are both pretty big. So we're good there. We can do the test. For my null hypothesis, the null is always just kind of this equals. So the mean for the old equals the mean for the new. And the alternative, we said we think that the old should be higher. So the mean for the old is greater than the mean for the new. You need your test statistic. For the unequal variances, the test statistic's easy. You subtract the two sample means and divide by each variance over its sample size. So it's very, very similar to the z-test. You just switch if you know population variance or sample variance. Okay. So just make sure we wrote old first. Make sure you used to put the old mean first. So we're going to do 4 minus 2 over the square root. My first variance is 16 and its sample size is 45. My second variance is 5 and its sample size is 16. And this gives me 3.019.
But for T distribution, we always name degrees of freedom. And that's what's difficult for this test. This is one of the reasons we do the equal variances if we think we can get away with it because it's so much easier to calculate. So degrees of freedom is you take your first variance over its sample size plus the next variance over its sample size. And then we square all of that. And then we're going to do the second variance. Okay. But we put this 4 here, so this actually means it's the standard deviation to the power of 4. Or, if you want to think about it, it's the variance squared over n squared times n minus 1 plus the second variance. Now we write s to the power of 4, which really means variance squared over m squared times n minus 1. There are reasons for it to be so long and complicated. I have gone through and proved it before, but not something you're ever going to do without taking a 7,000 level stats class. Instead, you just have your calculator do it for you. And believe that it works. Okay, so we have our first variance over sample size. So we have 16 over 45. Plus my second variance is 5 and its sample size is 16. Then we're going to square our first variance, so we're going to have here 16 squared over its sample size squared times the sample size minus 1. Plus my next one, that variance was 5 squared over its sample size of 60 squared times 60 minus 1. Again, we have the power 4, but that's technically standard deviation of the power 4, which is the same thing as variance squared. It's going to take forever to put into your calculator, but when you're done, you get 64.39. And remember to use our table. Well, anytime you use a T distribution, we'll round down to the nearest whole number. So that means degrees of freedom will equal 64. Now to use our actual t table, do you see a 60 on there, or 64 on there? We only have a 60, so we'll have to round down even further. So round to 60 degrees of freedom to use the table. So our p-value, here we have our 3.019. Look at your alternative hypothesis. It's a greater than, so we want to shade to the right. So 3.019, 60 degrees of freedom. Looks like we're about here. <coughs> and that puts us between 0 0.005 and 0 0.001. 0.001 to 0.005. That's going to be a small p-value. So we'll reject our null. And then we have evidence for the alternative. So evidence that the mean of the old is greater than the mean for the new. Then we write something like, we found very strong evidence that on average the new system saves time for all the invoices. So not just for our sample, but for all of the invoices, the entire population, the new system should save time because it should be smaller than the old system.